afternoon and welcome to the next in our series of the first 100 days webinars that we are we are doing. Today we are going to be discussing gun industry oversight. Previously we have discussed access to lethal means, safe storage, suicide prevention, and in the future we'll be discussing a public health approach. Today um, our focus really is on what the new administration can do to provide better oversight for the industry at large. We're going to discuss what that means, uh, but first I want to introduce our, our great panel that we have here today. Um, my name is Kai Hunter. I am the Sarah Brady Fellow at Brady, as well as a professor of military and strategic studies where I study suicide and domestic violence prevention among military members and veterans. I'm joined today by Dr. Daniel Webster, who is the inaugural Bloomberg Professor of American Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where he directs the Center for Gun Violence Prevention and Policy and serves as the co-lead for the Violence Prevention Workgroup of the Bloomberg-led American Health Institute. We're also joined by Dr. Shawnee Bugs, who's the Assistant Professor with Violence Prevention Research Program at University of California, Davis, which is the alma mater of everybody in my family except me. So they are all I know very excited that we have a, a, a Davis person here um, today with uh, Roseanne Ander, who is the founding executive director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab and Education Lab, which is part of University of Chicago's Urban Labs and Josh Scharf, who is the legal counsel and director of programs at Brady. So what do we mean when we talk about gun industry oversight? You know, this sounds like a very academic-y term, but let's, let's simplify it, let's dig in. So we know that when we're talking about crime and gun crime in particular, that guns don't grow on trees, they don't just show up. And the ones that are most commonly used in crimes don't just somehow magically appear in our streets in the hands of people who are, are using them to do ill. And almost all guns that are recovered by law enforcement for use in the crime started somewhere along the chain as a legally purchased gun. Somebody went into a gun shop and bought it legally, or at least by the law legally. We'll discuss a little bit more into what sort of that those legal purchases might actually mean but then get diverted into an illegal market and they end up as the guns that are being used in crimes on our, our streets. What we know is that many of the dealers from which these guns originally come engage in negligent and sometimes even criminal practices, but it is very, very hard to actually prosecute them or to, to take action. Industry or institutions such as the ATF have been hamstrung by lack of funding and lack of transparency for us to be able to actually know what's out there. And when we talk about some of these illegal practices at Brady and work that has been led by Josh that we'll discuss much more through the Freedom of Information Act requested inspection reports of dealers that have had uh, illegal guns traced back to them. And we have found that there are key characteristics of these dealers that mean that they may be more likely to engage in Illegal, and, or illegal or negligent behavior and divert guns to our streets. And so in simplicity, what we wanna talk about today is what we can actually do. What can the new administration do? What can federal agencies do? And what can state and local law enforcement as well as, as laws and policies do to better control the flow of guns from the legal market into the illegal market? I want to start first with Dr. Shawnee Bugs here. You recently published a joint piece on the underground mark gun markets in Baltimore. Can you talk more about how these illegal gun markets disproportionately impact urban communities and how they flow often from places outside of those communities into these communities? Sure, and thank you for having me. Um, so in communities with high rates of gun violence, guns are too easily accessible to individuals who are prohibited from having them or who can buy them without adhering to the legal requirements for purchase. We just, we know that. And with few exceptions, handgun purchasing and carrying among minors is illegal. And yet too many young people in communities disproportionately impacted by gun violence have access to firearms. 
Um, the richest information we have about the sources of those guns has come directly from individuals who are prohibited from purchasing or possessing firearms, but may still have access to them. Studies in Chicago, New York, and the one you mentioned in Baltimore that was led by Dr. Cassandra Cafasi and involved both myself and Dr. Webster have found that guns acquired by people prohibited from purchasing or possessing come from various sources. Some of those guns come from family or friends, but guns are also acquired illegally from the underground gun market or from straw purchasers who are people who purchase guns for someone who was unable to purchase them him or herself because they are prohibited from doing so. And the guns in the underground market also come from a variety of sources, such as straw purchasers, unregulated private sellers, gun shows, or theft. And it's important to note that many of the guns that flow from the legal market to the illegal market are transferred by a smaller number of people than many think. While guns may be available in the underground market, there's increasing evidence that you have to have the right connections and know the right person or people in order to get one. And that's really important when we're thinking about how do you regulate um, the, the supply side of firearms because there are a small number of people who are connected to that diversion that you're talking about from legal purchasing to illegal purchasing. Survey respondents in the underground gun markets have reported that having a trusted source is key. And that source may not be so easy to find if you don't have the right connections. There's evidence that some guns are trafficked from states with weaker gun laws and weaker restrictions about who can purchase guns and how they're purchased to states with more, rest more restrictive regulations. And we've seen evidence of this in places like Chicago and Baltimore where a high number of the guns recovered in crimes were purchased from surrounding states with fewer restrictions on who can legally purchase them. We also know that some guns in the underground market come from lax firearm dealers. In the study with Dr. Krafasi and Dr. Webster, we surveyed criminal justice involved individuals about their experiences in the Baltimore underground gun market. And a number of the respondents reported that knowing that there reported knowing that there are certain dealers in Maryland who will let purchasers skirt around the legal purchase requirements. And there are certain gun stores where it's easier to steal guns. So as you mentioned, there, the, the lax dealership um, really does play a factor in, in helping with that transfer from legal gun ownership or legal gun purchase to the underground market and to people who are prohibited from purchasing them. Yeah, when, when we talk about some of these more lax laws and policies, um, Daniel, wanna bring this one up with you. you know, you've done a lot of work showing on how policies that require and enforce both purchaser and dealer accountability for acquiring guns, you know, such as Brady background check laws, permit to purchase laws, reduce the likelihood that guns will end up diverted into the into the illegal market. Can you talk a little bit more about that work and then what sorts of, of policies, whether it's at the national level, but also state and local levels would would help to prevent you know, a lot of what Dr. Bugs is talking about here of it being easier for these guns to flow from sort of less strict to more strict areas? Yeah, it's, uh, absolutely. I'll just note, just to pick up on something that Shawnee said from our study about um, many of the active people who were active in this underground uh, gun market in Baltimore uh, were quite aware that there were some gun dealers that you could, you know, make illegal transactions from. Uh, it, it brought me back to uh, years ago now, uh, there was a gun shop just out over the city line um, Valley Guns, and, and Brady actually has a history uh, looking at that um, dealership. But it was stunning um, how many, I mean, every year there were over 100 guns used in crime in Baltimore from, from this gun shop. And you could literally go, I'm going to say, less than a quarter mile to another gun shop. Zero guns ended up uh, using in crime. So the location is basically the same. So how these dealers operate make a difference and how the we found in our research 
uh, the, the degree of regulation and oversight clearly matters. Um, now, in our studies, we principally uh, uh, take advantage, if you will, from a research standpoint, differences in states and how they regulate firearms and how they regulate uh, licensed gun shops. And um, this is important, sadly, because our federal regulations are so darn weak. Uh, they're really written in a, in a manner that uh, really allows a lot of bad actors to keep pumping guns into this criminal market uh, in a manner that we've been discussing. Um, our findings show that uh, the, there are at least, I, I think, four key policies that we see are connected here. One is uh, comprehensive background checks. Um, states without comprehensive background checks clearly uh, have both a higher volume of within state diversion for trafficking. Guns move very quickly from um, retailer to uh, crime involvement. Also a lot of interstate trafficking in the same way that Dr. Bugs was mentioning. Um, the other thing that we, we find is even uh, additionally more effective is a licensing process for those purchasers. Uh, that, is, that is particularly key. Um, and, and frankly, the stronger licensing system, the better. And, and, and it is so obvious from the gun trace data uh, that this matters immensely. Uh, the, the states with the uh, best regulatory systems uh, have a very small share of guns used in crime that uh, originally uh, originate from their states. But the final point I want to make that's really important on, on the part of the gun dealers is that um, because of the weakness in the federal oversight and regulations, uh, many states have filled that gap um, and require their own licensing regulatory process. We found interestingly though, that um, simply having that kind of state licensing by itself didn't really matter. We actually surveyed uh, law enforcement in the, in the states that had these uh, licensing processes and the ones that really used those regulations and applied them with uh, uh, very regular and routine processes to make sure that uh, dealers were in compliance, there you see a pretty large effect in reducing diversions into this underground gun market. So, um, so bottom line is you need these comprehensive systems, both with purchasing and in, in, in the retailers and the enforcement mechanism. Last thing I'll say here is that all these regulations that I'm talking about really are uh, not particularly burdensome to the purchase, the gun purchasers themselves. And they generally, in our in our surveys, we find very high support for all these regulations, including among gun owners. And 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 the interesting thing is. The best regulated states, the gun owners like the regulations even more because I think they see they work. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really important point is that these aren't things that are overly burdensome on individuals that do choose to purchase guns and and often actually I think you know, a little of of the research I'm currently doing in Colorado has very similar side is that these regulations make gun owners feel like more responsible people often and they can sort of tout that I'm responsible even more. And so there's a little bit of that emotional feedback of, look, I'm doing the right thing and I am helping to further prevent crime. I think if you frame it that way, we're seeing a lot of that positive too, of that, that sort of reinforcing mechanism as well. So it's, uh, personally, I feel good that my research might be going somewhere then. <laughs> um, but I, I, I want to turn to, too, another part of the you know, the equation of how we know some of these things are working, which is transparency in, in data there and transparency. And it's something that's really hard. You know, one of the, the tools that the ATF has is the E-Trace system that's available to law enforcement, which allows law enforcement to trace a gun recovered in a crime back to where it, it came from. And uh, Rosanna, you helped facilitate a 2017 trace report using this data in Chicago to identify from where these guns that were recovered in crimes are actually 
coming. Um, can you talk a little bit about that report and the process you you took to do it and and what you learned? Great. Um, yeah, and thank, thanks for the invitation to be a part of this conversation. I think it's it's just incredibly important given the huge increase in, in gun violence that so many cities are facing and really sort of broadening the sort of lens around the different policy options and strategies. I think we spend an enormous amount of time focusing on the end user, the person caught with the gun, the person shot, and not enough really going upstream and sort of understanding how that gun got there in the first place. As, as um, Shani said, a lot of the individuals are prohibited. If you're under a certain age, you're not allowed to have a handgun. And you know, if you have certain um, criminal or, or other background, um, um, so, so I think one of the things that we did here in Chicago, I, I think most folks probably know that Chicago actually has pretty restrictive laws, policies, ordinances, um, locally, um, and uh, and in fact, I don't think we have still to this day a single gun store in Chicago. So every gun that's used in a crime in Chicago started somewhere else. And you know, given how much gun violence Chicago and many other cities face, I think it's an important question to ask: Where did the guns come from? What was the pathway? And it, it is just shockingly um, uh, opaque. Let's put it that way. Um, the, the pathway. And so we had the opportunity to work with the Chicago Police Department, the uh, city of Chicago mayor's office to do something that did not require a bunch of data scientists and, and fancy uh, degrees to do just some descriptive data analysis um, to work with the Chicago Police Department to take the, the trace data that you just described, Kai, every time a gun is recovered, whether it's in a crime, a suicide on the street, it gets submitted to ATF to be traced to figure out where it was first purchased, what gun store, um, who was the purchaser to really try to understand some of those patterns and pathways that might point to some illicit activity. And so we worked with the city of Chicago and the police department to just take all of that trace data over the last few years and put together a very simple report. To me, what is shocking is how much attention it got because it wasn't anything um, groundbreaking in terms of science. It was just here's where the guns that are showing up in Chicago were first purchased and um, some of the patterns that emerged from that. And it, you know, again, it's just, it really points out that this information is so, you know, the public has a right to know the impact is so significant and yet so much basic information is really kept under wraps. And, and I wanna give the city of Chicago and the Chicago Police Department some credit because there was enormous pressure from the federal government, even from sort of ATF um, headquarters to not do this. Um, when push came to shove, they ultimately had to sort of acquiesce and, and you know, couldn't really punish um, Chicago Police Department uh, for doing this. There were all kinds of threats made. Um, and the report was just looking at very, very basic patterns and trends of you know where guns were first purchased, what you know were they coming from inside Illinois, outside of Illinois, um, you know, and just who were the top dealers that were supplying a lot of the the crime guns that were ending up on the streets of Chicago. Um, I, I think this is the kind of thing that really ought to be a no-brainer. Um, and frankly, that the ATF used to do itself. Um, years ago, ATF was doing tremendous work pushing out information um, with trace reports. And it, it's really been over the last decade or so that it's been kind of under wraps. But you know, I, I would argue that if, you know, if we want to have trust in government, government needs to be a heck of a lot more transparent. And on something as life and death as gun violence, uh, I think the burden should be even higher in terms of um, requiring government to, to share data. Yeah, and that's Josh. That's what I want to talk about next. You know, this this transparency. You know, Chicago came under a lot of threats for, you know, publicizing this. You know, from a, a legal perspective, can you talk about you know first of all why this has been so transparent, but also really why it it shouldn't be? Because I think that's one of the things is we've we've sort of come to accept that oh, it's just going to be secretive because anything with guns need to be secretive because all sorts of crazy theories as, as to why, but when you break it down, you know, it actually should be transparent and there's very important legal arguments um, as to as to why. So can you discuss some of those, those legal arguments and then also, you know, a lot of the work Brady has done to bring this transparency to light in order to save lives. Sure, happy to do so. And, and, and thank you for having me. It's great to be part of this conversation. 
Um, you know, to, to understand, I think, the issues with transparency um, and the lack of, of data that's actually out there, the, the trace data out there, uh, is really you need to take a look at the what I consider the, the perceived and some real limitations of what we call the, the TR amendment, um, which is a rider that has existed since the early 2000s on the appropriations bills that come out of Congress that places certain limitations on ATF's uh, ability to, to disseminate trace data from the E-Trace database. And, uh, you know, in, in my view and in, in the view of many others, what we're really dealing with is an overbroad interpretation by the ATF of what TR actually means and what TR actually does restrict. And I think we're actually in a really exciting time right now um, in taking another look at TR, a, a, a very close look at some of the arguments that have been out there uh, for quite some time and also some new arguments that have come up and had some success um, that, that really highlights that TR is much more flexible than the ATF makes it out to be. And I think you have to start with the exceptions that are written right into the amendment. Um, and the least controversial exception, which is right there in the plain text, is uh, an exception uh, for statistical annual reporting that comes out of the ATF, about the reports that ATF can release to the public that contains information that would be derived from the TRACE uh, database. And ATF, uh, as was alluded to earlier, ATF used to put out a great commerce and firearms report uh, used to put out a report called Following the Gun. Uh, these are reports that really detailed trafficking routes and patterns and information um, that really, again, the Chicago Trace Report really, uh, in a sense, duplicated a lot of that effort. Um, and, and ATF has that ability right in TR to put out that information. And I think it's exciting right now that we can push the new administration to release more detailed information to the public about the origin of, of guns that are traced uh, back to crime. And also within the language of TART is an exception for what we call statistical aggregate data, uh, data that uh, may not be raw trace data, may not give you the exact uh, information from each individual gun that is recovered, but can be aggregated together. Um, no definition on, on how much is an aggregation, so probably just anything more than one, um, and, and released to the public. And, and that's also important because those data sources could be uh, acquired through Freedom of Information Act requests and not just at the discretion of what ATF chooses to release in a, in a, in a report. And, and uh, you know, actually there is a great decision that just came out of the Ninth Circuit, which is really exciting, on statistical aggregate data, uh, where the Center for Investigative Reporting requested from the ATF data about guns that had originated, uh, that were traced back to crime that had originated from law enforcement, meaning law enforcement after they had um, it finished with the weapon had either sold it um, or perhaps guns that had been stolen from law enforcement. Um, and the ATF fought the release of that data and the Ninth Circuit recently ruled that it was statistical aggregate data and that it could be released. And I think also um, we can take another look about the actual reach and the validity of TR itself. And, you know, TR is ultimately a federal appropriations rider. It is designed to restrict what ATF can and can't uh, spend funds on. So there's always been an open question about well, what does that mean about states and local law enforcement that have access to this data and at what point is that data become the property of the state and the local uh, entities. And, and those are questions I think that are, are worth taking another look at um, and how far Congress can reach into the states and into local governments to restrict what they do uh, with data that they, they have access to. And of course, you know, again, uh, another very exciting argument that came out of the Ninth Circuit uh, was not fully in, uh, adopted, I would say, by another circuit recently, the Second Circuit, um, is, is whether TR is actually still a valid uh, FOIA exemption statute. Uh, under, under FOIA, there is what we call a B3 exemption, uh, which is data that cannot be released subject to a restriction in a separate statute. And Congress actually, um, a few years ago passed what's called the Open FOIA Act, which requires any uh, statutes like this that restrict the release of data through uh, the Freedom of Information Act to specifically recite to Section B3 of the Freedom of Information Act, which TR doesn't do. And the Ninth Circuit took actually a, 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 a very close look at this and found that actually TR is no longer a restriction uh, to FOIA requests like this because it does not cite back specifically to FOIA as the, the Open FOIA Act re 
you know, requires. So I think we're in an exciting time about taking another look at TART. I think we can push uh, from the new administration and from ATF to take a more reasonable interpretation. Um, and we can continue to promote uh, these, what, what we would consider very legal, you know, very reasonable legal interpretations, uh, not just in court, but also to local and state law enforcement who also have access to, to trace data. Great, and I, I also appreciate your interpretation of a lot of these decisions for us as a non-legal person to actually understand what it means. And so it, it, it's important. And I want to now sort of combine a few of these things to, together. And um, this is going to be a question for everyone, but I'm gonna slightly modify it for each of our panelists based on their, their expertise and the work they've done. I mean, we've been talking about how transparency needs to be absolutely important so that we can arm communities, law enforcement agencies, really with the tools to hold the right people accountable for, you know, for getting these guns in, into the wrong hands. Um, there's also a, a large vein and, and research around, you know, community-based intervention programs. And there's a, a intersection really of these two. And so I'm going to start with Dr. Bugs, uh, who has done work around community you, community interventions and supply side accountability. And can you talk a little bit about how you know, your work amplifies what some of the relationships should be between your know, investment in you know, community violence programs while also holding up these, these supply side programs? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I think Community violence intervention and prevention strategies are designed to work at the individual and, and community level. And they're essentially downstream responses to the easy accessibility of the firearms in those communities with high rates of gun violence. Um, Rosanna talked about, you know, the, the focus on the end user and um, how we're not looking far enough upstream. And the community interventions essentially have no impact on the flow of guns coming into the communities. They work to address the demands, but they don't have any discernible impact on supply. And we we won't win the fight against community gun violence without aggressively addressing, you know, honestly, the, the economic profiting off of the deaths occurring in those communities. The fact that there are dealers and um, individuals who serve as dealers who are um, helping with the trafficking of guns into those communities. I think it's really telling when you hear, you know, Dr. Webster and Rosen talk about the fact that gun stores in Baltimore and Chicago are virtually non-existent. And yet those are cities where we're seeing lots of, of gun violence. And there, there has to just be a, a refocusing on where these guns are coming from, who is, who is profiting from these guns coming into the communities. And elected officials have the power and authority to curb that flow of guns into the underground market by looking upstream and, and addressing where the guns are coming from, who's responsible for that diversion of firearms from the legal to the illegal markets, and what laws and regulations can help stem that tide. And um, you know, as, as Dr. Webster pointed out, we, there, we've seen regulations work at the state level. Um, to, to help reduce that diversion um, of guns coming in from areas where it's easier to buy them to those areas where it's, where it's harder um, to find them and to, and to purchase them. So I think it's, it's incumbent upon elected officials and authorities to recognize that that focus on the end user is, is too far downstream and it's too reactive. We have to be more proactive. And um, there just is very, I think there's little argument to defend why we're not looking further upstream um, and holding those individuals accountable for that diversion. Yeah, I think that that looking upstream is is so important. And so Daniel, for, for you, you know, your work really showing that there is support even among gun owners for these policies that we know reduce the flow of guns into these communities. You know, so when we're talking about how to get states to adopt these laws, because really we, we've seen states step in, are there any 
tips, tactics, strategies, you know, that our, our people who are listening can use really to, to push to their, their elected officials to show that, no, these, these work, these are life-saving measures, and they have a lot of support because we're clearly not seeing them, them get there in the, in the areas that we should. Yeah, there's a loaded question too. It'd be like, solve, sure. solve getting all these passed. You're good, right? <laughs> sure. So, uh, you know, the gun lobby has been uh, quite masterful at um, uh, when very reasonable uh, regulations are presented as, uh, you know, policy alternatives. Frankly, they change the conversation to, to something else and the government's coming to get your guns uh, and, and crazy stuff like that. Uh, the reality is that, um, you know, in our surveys, again, we, we find that uh, gun owners want to shop at uh, gun shops that um, uh, play by the rules. Um, they want assurances that uh, there's proper oversight. Um, I think most of our uh, survey questions relevant to this uh, that we ask about both transparency and accountability issues with um, um, gun shops, we get over 75 to 80 percent of gun owners supporting those kinds of things. You know, we're, we're now in an age where uh, none of us will uh, decide where we're going to go to lunch before looking at all the Raider reviews, right, or uh, what uh, product we're going to buy online. Yet, we are living in a world where there is no information about uh, gun shops and who actually is has the best compliance record. Um, so I, I think that we need to start uh, putting uh, pressure uh, for changes in Congress, but also changes in um, ATF as well. The la last thing I, I just want to mention on this um, is that um, in over my 30 years of, of research, I, I see all these federal programs where they're trying to um, you know, give resources and evaluations to what strategies work for in public safety. What you never see is any program to actually look at what is working from federal law enforcement. Um, ATF is sitting on a lot of data. They could look inward a little bit about which practices are most effective in holding uh, gun shops accountable and reducing those diversions to guns uh, to, for criminal purposes. So um, even, even without Congress doing anything, ATF could do a lot internally to really uh, place a priority on compliance activities and actually evaluate and monitor uh, that, that uh, success. Yeah, you had that relationship with the federal law enforcement. Rosanna wanted to um, hit that. It's like you all know how just to to tie into each other, and it's lovely. Um, but you wanted to to hit on that. You know, when you started working with this this trace data, um, how you know how did you engage with the ATF? I know there were some you know potential threats for you know, disciplinary, for lack of a better term, uh, action coming out of this, but. Do you have any lessons for how local and law enforcement, local law enforcement and federal law enforcement can work together better on this based on, on what you found or suggestions at least based on, on your experiences? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I mean, I think, I, I don't, I don't wanna get anybody in trouble, but I think the truth was we had really terrific local partners here, including at the federal level, in the U.S. Attorney's Office and and with the ATF, and I think that they had to repeat what they were being told from the D.C. office, but were um, as supportive as they could be without kind of violating the sort of uh, you know the, the things that they'd been told to sort of where they'd been told to hold the line. And and look, Chicago Police Department wanted to put this information out there because I, I think certainly if you're a city like Chicago, none of the guns are coming from Chicago and yet you are bearing enormous burden of the gun violence. And so trying to be more transparent about the complicity, the sort of culpability, the responsibility that other communities had 
um, and other actors had that was having the, the you know dire consequences on the streets of Chicago. And so the ATF locally is also dealing with trying to disrupt the gun violence and seeing the human toll that it was taking. And so um, you know I, I do think that there is a lot of you know, positive kind of work that happens between local um, law enforcement and federal, including ATF. I think it really is when the sort of politics and, you know, some of these other forces come into play that, that you run into some problems. I mean, that's not true everywhere, but that certainly was our experience in Chicago. And, you know, the, the national uh, office did kind of threaten all kinds of things and basically couldn't do anything because ultimately, as Josh described, the data was, Chicago crime guns that they, you know, asked ATF to trace, but it, it was essentially Chicago data, and there was really no way to punish Chicago. And you know, so they, you know, did a lot of chest beating and threatened, but it was all sort of for naught. And um, you know, and I, I, like, I think there are ways that that they could have made things more difficult for Chicago, but but that really wasn't in in anyone's interest. And I, I do think that there is. You know, good collaboration, and and I think, you know, it's it's just good practice generally to, um, you know, to to believe that we have the, a common goal here, which is to try to reduce gun violence, and so we worked with, and not just with um, the federal, you know, with ATF and with the Chicago Police Department, but with community organizations who wanted this information, right? So, like, I think it really is about getting aligned around what's the goal here. Is this going to be helpful or not? And I think there really was. A consensus that it, you know it, it wouldn't hurt and it might help, and so so I think it was a a positive experience uh, for everybody involved, despite the sort of you know uh, messages coming down from DC. Yeah, you know, the importance of the local, you know, really the local partnerships and local relationships are so important because nobody wants to see this violence in their backyard, and so the people who are there actually see it. And you know, with that, that Josh, you know, we talked about the transparency in, in data and what we can learn from it for local officials. So I would, I would love for you to talk a little bit about the algorithm that Brady has developed as a result of these you know, inspection reports that were come from the Freedom of Information Act and how you know, they can provide good tools, particularly to local level officials to you know, address what Dr. Bugs was talking about, about having to look further up upstream because there's some some real potential here that it's not just a, you know, come down with a hammer all the time, but ways to really intervene and to identify key characteristics before it ever gets to the point of these guns being diverted. Yeah, and I think, right, so this goes back to um, Brady's need, and, I, and it's not just Brady's needs, I think it's, it's a widespread need in the gun violence prevention community to think really creatively about data sources. Um, and, and Kai, what, what Kai is referencing is, is really a, what's, what's going on over three years now, an effort to obtain through Freedom of Information Act requests and ultimately litigation, uh, inspection reports uh, of gun dealers that when the ATF had inspected them, uh, they found serious or repeated violations that were significant enough to lead to some sort of remedial action. Uh, in ATF speak, that's a warning letter, a warning conference, or in a very, very small percentage of cases, a license revocation. And you know, Brady has, has now obtained uh, tens, tens of thousands of pages of inspection reports, uh, thousands of reports uh, from the ATF that really tell this incredible story on the macro level about ATF oversight of the the gun industry, but also on the micro level of what individual gun stores uh, are doing, um, you know, and, and the violations uh, that a small number of them are committing um, that, that really uh, put the public safety at risk. And there's lots of great data opportunities with this, and we're, we're very excited about what we've been acquiring, and we have every intention of making it public um, so that others, uh, researchers, um, can uh, really dig into this data and, and, you know, do far more with it than we could have ever dreamed. Um, but what Kai is referencing is that we have worked with a, you know, a, a, a blue chip uh, consulting firm with a top tier data analytics team um, to marry the data that we're obtaining from these, these tens of thousands of pages of information with uh, other data sets out there um, that can give us information about the characteristics of gun dealers. Uh, and looking for patterns and common, you know, commonalities um, uh, of, of certain characteristics that might be predictive 
of what stores are more likely than others to be violating uh, federal law when transferring firearms. And uh, based on our preliminary work, we've gotten to a, to a point where uh, it's over four times more likely than uh, random selection to identify a dealer that is violating the law. So we're very excited about that. We think that it is a tool uh, to be able to uh, increase the efficiencies and the effectiveness of, of state and local inspection regimes. There's a great opportunity to use it on a federal level too, should, should the ATF be um, welcoming to that, um, but to really increase oversight uh, over industry actors that are violating the law. Um, and, and of course, it also raises a lot of research questions that we hope uh, will be addressed. Um, you know, can this be married with trace data? Should we have ever be able to get it public um, to develop, develop more definitive links between uh, non-compliance with the law and, and supplying the criminal market? We know from back in the early 2000s that the ATF certainly thought that, that it was the case that way. Um, and, and they actually found that of the top 200 or so dealers that were the largest suppliers of crime guns, uh, that when inspected, 75% uh, or more of them were found to have violations. And that's pretty significant, uh, particularly compared to when they generally find violations. So we're really excited about this. We think there's a lot that can be done with it. And we think that it, it raises a lot of great research uh, questions for the research community. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and it's really a message, I think, to all of us as well, is that we need to think creatively, right? Uh, we will continue to push for the best trace data and other data on gun trafficking that we can get. Um, but we also need to think creatively about other sources that can give us even more insight into uh, gun trafficking uh, and really the supply side of, of crime guns. Yeah, and it, it really, I think, is this good example of the combination between research and potential applications, which is where I, I want to shift now, you know, sort of to, to wrap this up. You know, we've talked about a lot of great research that is, is out there that you're doing that your your uh, your colleagues are doing but we've also got a really unique moment right now where we have an administration that has identified gun violence prevention as a key priority and there are both executive action and legislative action that can be taken and so um for for each of you again and i'm gonna you're gonna go in a different order this time i realize i've like put you all in the same order over and over again um want you to think about you know what what would be your top like one to three sort of priorities uh, based on based on your work and based on your findings that should be taken that will have a the most really immediate impact for um addressing this the supply side sort of oversight um, enforcement side. And so uh, Dr. Webster, we're gonna start with you this time. Thanks. Um, actually, what I'm gonna raise is something that hasn't even come up in our conversation yet. And, and that is um, uh, do-it-yourself gun kits or, or sometimes referred to as ghost guns. Uh, I think that is a huge threat and um, we are now well trained to talk about gaps in background checks and how that facilitates um, acquisition of firearms for dangerous people. Uh, but obviously these um, uh, kits that you can get online and assemble your own firearm do the same thing. And uh, uh, criminals are using them, very dangerous people are, are using them and domestic, domestic terrorists are, are using them. So I, I've got to put that at the top of the list of actions to take to ATF to define those as firearms, uh, just as if I'm going to order a couch from a, a, a Kia, it's probably going to come in a bunch of parts that I have to put them together, but it's still a couch. Same idea with uh, do-it-yourself gun kits. Um, the other uh, things that I would focus on and, and something I'm uh, I believe the Biden administration is committed to is also uh, really um, clamping down on um, unlicensed sellers, people who sell a lot of guns, uh, yet they do it without a license. And obviously it's very easy to do that these days. Um, so we, we've been talking about a small number of licensed gun dealers as we should there's also a relatively small number of unlicensed sellers that are doing the same kind of problematic behavior. 
and uh, we need uh, both executive actions, well, principally executive actions and follow through to really make that a priority. So th those are the things that I, I would focus on in addition to the things we've already covered is, uh, is, is addressing those issues. Um, and uh, I, I think we'll, we would have a, a much better opportunity to uh, disrupt this uh, too easy access to firearms for people who are both dangerous and legally prohibited. Yeah, you know, the sort of do it yourself, ghost guns things is, uh, you know, it, it's one of those issues that I think will, you're right, will start getting the attention that that it deserves. Um, Josh, I want to kick it to, to you next, you know, because I know you've also done some work on the ghost gun sides, but what else would you would you see as necessary action that can be taken? Yeah, I think, right, I mean, I'd be remiss to not lead off with uh, a more reasonable interpretation of TRT and its restrictions. Um, and, you know, I, I, and I think the experience that Rosanna had in Chicago, frankly, was unnecessary, right? The, the difficulty um, in, in maneuvering the politics to get everyone on board, or at least not to uh, object too much. And um, I think the administration and ATF leadership, um, and I, I should also mention that ATF leadership is important to have a director of the ATF, which we haven't had in, in quite some time, um, or at least a, a confirmed, a Senate confirmed uh, director, um, but to, to uh, take a more reasonable interpretation of TR and release more data about gun trafficking uh, and gun tracing to the public and to the research community. Um, that, that, that's something that I would definitely lead off with. Um, I would also say it's time to take a really hard look at the ATF inspection system um, about both the number of, of gun industry actors that are being inspected every given year, uh, which is low and below its own targets. Um, and then, you know, how its own internal policies on how it decides what remedial action uh, to administer when a dealer is violating the law. You know, it's easy to say, hey, this is just, you know, one violation, um, I should get off lightly, but, but, you know, we know the damage that one gun can do. Um, we are not selling widgets here, you know, we are selling very dangerous firearms. So taking a really close and hard look at how the ATF is uh, inspecting dealers and the remedial action that they're administering uh, when they found, find significant or repeated violations. That'd be my top two. Um, but, you know, I, I think uh, Dr. Webster's suggestions on ghost guns uh, are certainly uh, would be up there for me uh, as well and, and cracking down on unlicensed dealers, um, which is, you know, seems to be uh, a minimum of, of what the agency, you know, what the ATF and the administration can do. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Just the even just interpreting laws, easy way to start too. The pretty pretty low low cost to get there. Um, Rosanna, you know, coming from a community that has really good gun laws yet is still plagued by by gun violence, you know, where do you see some of the the most meaningful federal interventions that can happen? Yeah, so I uh, I have no idea what is politically possible. Um, so, I mean, I do think that um, making, so, I mean, the trust in government at every level, at every part of government, and there's been a lot of focus on policing, but I think trust in government writ large is just, you know, lower than it's ever been. I think one way for government to start to gain trust is to be much more transparent and much more accountable. So I do think that really pushing out much more data, not just the trace data, but just much more data and information so that residents have some visibility in what's happening in their community and, and what the government is doing in response um, would be a good start. I have no idea if, if this is even possible, but you know, I, I think um, ATF has been vulnerable for a long time because it's a very small agency. And I, I, you know, I wonder if it's worth like taking a fresh look at what a federal response to gun violence ought to look like, both from a law enforcement and a public health perspective, and whether ATF is even constructed to, to be able to do that or whether we should be taking a, a you know a whole new approach to things. Now that may just be politically impossible. Um, so I, you know, that's why I have this job and not any of those jobs. But but I do think that um, 
so much of what we end up doing is just like minimal, minimal nibbling around the edges, you know, uh, begging for crumbs and not sort of really thinking about what it would take to have a, an effective response to gun violence in, in a country that has enshrined the Second Amendment as an individual right. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't think we're going to put that genie back in the bottle. So given that, how do we, um, you know, uh, address the, the incredible carnage that guns are having in this country? I think, you know, we can talk about the, the political realities, but also if we don't ask the real hard structural questions, we'll never get to how far we can actually move it. So I think it's really important to be raising those as to, you know, is the ATF structured and funded the best way it can actually be to, to do this job? And uh, Dr. Bugs, want to kick it over to you. What, where, where do you really see federal, you know, federal application for policy here? Yeah, um, you know the 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 benefit curse of going last after after a round robin like this um, is that it's there's not much left unsaid. Um, I agree with what everyone else said, um, but I really want to underscore what Rosanna just said that the the piecemeal approach that we've been taking to gun violence prevention is not working. And that real need to overhaul the way that we are focusing on gun violence prevention from enforcement side, supply side, demand side, really need to rethink how we're approaching this. And um, I, I agree as, as Rosanna said, and as Josh said, you know, ATF um, inspections and um, the enforcement of those inspections is a problem. As Daniel talked about, the, the do-it-yourself guns, um, the disproportionate impact that small numbers of dealers or individuals who are selling more guns um, are having and when it comes to guns that later show up in crimes um, and are purchased by individuals who are both prohibited and dangerous. Um, and all of that, I think, speaks to this need to really just take a, an entirely new look at how we're approaching this issue uh, because the piecemeal work, the, the underfunding and um, of enforcement, the fact that we're not looking upstream well enough, just all of that I think underscores that while we there are some immediate steps that can be taken and, I, and everyone has already articulated that, but there is an also a, a real need to to have a fresh look. Jeff talked about, I mean, excuse me, Josh talked about date, um, creative data sources. We need to be taking creative looks at how we actually approach this issue and recognizing that there are so many um, individuals, entities, agencies, elected officials who have a responsibility to this and how can we rethink how everyone plays a role in gun violence prevention and everyone plays a role in thinking comprehensively about the problem. Yeah, I think you know, that holistic approach is so important. We have tried, I think, just to take these one little bites at, at a time rather than looking at you, know, how are we getting at the, the big pictures here? Um, any Daniel, I just saw you uh, unmute yourself, so jump on yeah, in. Sorry, sorry. I, I just wanted to jump in one, one other comment. Um, you know, 2020 has been a really difficult year in gun violence. Uh, we've seen, uh, I believe, the largest one year increase in many, many decades. Um, there's a lot to, there a lot of reasons perhaps but clearly one important reason was a breakdown in trust between communities and law enforcement. And I feel that the issue that we're talking about today about looking at the upstream and where the guns are coming from is part, it's not, it's not nearly enough, but it is part of what needs to be done to rebuild that trust. Because um, the communities most impacted by this problem uh, are understandably very cynical that anyone cares about their lives. And um, one demonstration uh, that it, to show that it does matter and that um, we're, uh, the system is not just set up to uh, incarcerate uh, mass quantities of, uh, of persons of color, but they're actually trying to get to the individuals who are creating 
massive harm, harm on a very broad scale of the type that we're talking about today. So I, I do think that uh, it's a very timely discussion that we need to keep putting forward because it, 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 it's critical to rebuild that trust and it's critical to reshape the law enforcement system to hold folks accountable who are creating the biggest harm. Can I just offer one additional comment if we have a second? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's what Daniel just said is, is really important. And, and I, I think people maybe, you know, who are not as old as I am at least, don't remember that it was actually the, the gun lobby that really kind of reframed the conversation when some progressive gun policies were starting to be passed in the early 80s um, and 90s, they kind of pivoted away from you know, gun policy being the answer to quote unquote bad people. And they underwrote the very first three strikes law that ever passed. The gun lobby underwrote that in, um, in Washington state. And before that, it was not a particularly popular policy option. And so I think there, you know, we really do need to unwind the arms race, but also mass incarceration. And we can't do that by only focusing on the sort of end result, the person caught with the gun in their hand, we really do need to understand the complicity and the sort of contribution from lots of different actors upstream. And I do think the federal government um, has a role to try to think about what a rational, reasonable, um, response should be for a country as diverse um, as as we are, um, you know, wh where we have landed is is not good really for anybody. Yeah, you know that that trust piece in you know, with with law enforcement and the who is being held accountable is such an important part of of this conversation. And you know, I think it really highlights how you know gun industry oversight sounds like this kind of big academic -y term, but it comes down to some of these most basic things that we're feeling right now. Who we trust, who's being held accountable for things, how we can feel about our government actually working for us again. And so I, I wanna thank you all so much for being part of this incredibly important life-saving discussion, as well as for everybody for, for joining us today. You know, the work that you are all doing out there is uh, what, allowed us to be in a position to have this conversation in the first place. Um, this w video will be available on Brady's website as well for you to share around with your friends and families at uh, bradyunited.org as well as follow us on Twitter at BradyBuzz to get this available. Thank you so much for, for all that you're doing and um, hoping for a time we can all be in person again soon. Um, Please stay tuned for our next in this series, looking at a public health approach as well. So thank you so much for, for having us today.